Today we'll be giving a gameplay overview and review of Cauldron Bubble and Boil. Which is appropriate because it's kind of warm up here. Have a bit of a heat wave, you can probably see the sweat. <laughs> I feel like I'm in a cauldron. Hi everyone, I'm Tracy, the Gaming Maven. And I'm Stefan, the Games Teacher. And well, today we're going to talk about Cauldron, Bubble and Boil. <laughs> and my pretty Creating some recipes. Ooh. So are you looking to see what the setup is? Looking to see what you think of the game? Well, click on the timestamp below. If you like what you see, leave us a comment and tell us how we're doing. And subscribe so you get notified when we post new content. And with that, we've got Cauldron all set up ready and ready to go. So let's get to it. In Cauldron, Bubble and Boil, players are witches looking to complete the most recipes while also hexing their opponents, building gardens so they can harvest ingredients for your recipes and get the most points by the end of the game. So here we have the components for Cauldron, Bubble and Boil. To start with, we have our main victory point track, four player Diablerie tracks, the deck of hex cards, tokens in the player colors, crone tokens, corruption tokens, the eponymous cauldrons, one for each player, four different types of resource tokens, and here we have the first mini expansion, it's the advanced victory conditions deck. We have the second expansion, the moon deck, and then the third expansion is the coven rolls deck. So here we have a setup for two players. Each player will get their own Diablerie track and put one of their player markers at the start of the Diablerie track. They'll also put the other of their player markers at the start of the Victory Points track. Each player will get dealt five of the hex cards into their hand to start with. They'll each take a cauldron and each player will get one of each resource in their cauldron. The resources, uh, the amount of resources available in the game are based on player count with two players at 16 of each color. We'll set the corruption tokens and the crone tokens off to the side and then we're ready to start. So we'll determine start player by any means necessary and in this case my pink player will start first. The player's turn order is resolved completely and then play proceeds to the next player who resolves all of their turn order. In this case, my start player will look at their hand of five cards, and the first thing they can do is they can choose, if they wish, to hex, cast a hex. Now a hex, hex cards have a number of different features on them, but I'll show you an example of one. When we're talking about casting a hex in the first phase of the turn order, that refers to this book looking area on the card. On the left is the cost of the hex, and on the right is the effect. To follow through with my example, if I wanted to cast this hex, I would pay the cost, which is to move up on my Diablerie track because of the skull icon. And here it says to draw one resource from my cauldron. Now, once you put things in your cauldron, you're never allowed to look inside your cauldron uh, throughout the game. So you have to kind of remember what goes in your cauldron and what comes out. So I will just quickly, without looking, pull a resource out of my cauldron and it goes back to the supply. I have now paid my cost for the hex and the effect is that all other players gain one corruption token. So they will take a corruption token from the supply and put it in their cauldrons. Now I can choose to cast additional hexes if I wish, however each additional hex will cost me more corruption. So if I cast a second hex, in addition to the hex costs, I would also take a corruption token and put it in my cauldron. If I wanted to cast a third hex, that would then cost me two additional corruption beyond the corruption I've already taken this turn. So it becomes more and more uh, expensive in corruption tokens to cast multiple hexes. 
I'm going to stop casting hexes at this point, and this card basically gets discarded to our hex card discard pile. The next phase of my turn order is I must harvest all my gardens. Well, if we look, I have no gardens yet, so I can't do that phase. I'll just skip over it in the first round. The third step is that I may plant one garden, and a garden consists of two or more cards with matching garden cube colors. So if I look at my, the rest of my hand, I can see that in fact I have two cards with matching garden cube colors. And what that's referring to in these cards is the top part, which is like green grass. You can see that there's cubes here that are green and have the letter G for green. And so because I have two that have matching colors, I can plant them together as a garden. And I'm gonna choose to do that. And then I will fill up the cubes from the supply based on the cubes that are showing at the top of the cards. So two on that one and one on that one. I have now planted my garden, finishing phase three of my turn order. The next thing I can do is I can choose, if I wish, to record a recipe in my spell book. Now what that's referring to is the third part of these cards. At the bottom, you can see the title of a given uh, potion, the amount of victory points it'll earn me at the end of the game, and the cost in different colored cubes. So if I wanted to, I could choose in phase four of my turn order to put one of these cards underneath my cauldron not allowed to look at it for the rest of the game. So I have to remember not only what goes in my cauldron, but also what recipes I've placed or recorded into my spell book and placed underneath my cauldron. Finally, the last step or last phase of a player's turn order is they can choose to optionally discard as many cards as they wish from their hand. So if there's cards you wanted to get rid of, this would be a good time. Um, and draw back up to five. Now there is no hand limit so if a player already has five or more cards, they still get to draw one additional card from the hex deck. Um, in this case, I don't want this card anymore, so I'm gonna discard it, leaving me with no cards, and I'll draw five from the deck. To end my turn. So, now that I have a garden out, I can actually show you how phase two of the garden harvest works. So imagine that we were into the next round and I wanted to, I had already chosen whether or not to cast any hexes on players. In this case, I'll have passed. Um, and now I get again to phase two of my turn order and I want to harvest my garden. So the way that works is quite simply, you remove one cube from each card where a cube exists. So uh, this card had two cubes, this card had one. So I don't remove all of the cubes, I remove one from this card and one from this card, and they simply go into my culture. I won't be able to complete harvesting this garden until my following turn, when I could then, again, follow the harvest action to remove a cube from each card remaining and put it in my cauldron. Now that I've completed harvesting this garden fully and all of the cubes have been removed, I would then discard the garden cards and for having completely harvested my garden, I would get one crone token, which at the end of the game is worth three victory points. And I just sim simply set this aside. This is open information. Uh, the uh, crone tokens are open information for everyone to see. When game end is triggered, the round continues until all players have had an equal number of turns. Then at the end of the game, we discard all, discard all gardens in play. In this case, we have none. Um, the game is triggered uh, in one of four ways. When a player puts their seventh hex card in their recipe book, or their spell book. When two resources are fully depleted, so if red and orange had been fully depleted, that would also be an end game trigger. Um, when the last crone or corruption token is taken from the supply, or when one or more players reach the top of their Diablerie track.
In game end, we'll do final scoring, and I'll give you an example of how that works. On the main score track is a list of different scoring conditions. The first thing we'll look at is we'll score each player's uh, number on their Diablerie track and add them to their victory point total. So in this case, pink would get nine additional victory points, go to 24, and white would get six additional victory points, and go to 29. Then the player with the highest on their Diablerie track gets plus five. So in this case, pink would get five more. And the player with the lowest on the Diablo track, in this case white, gets plus 10. So they're actually rewarded for being less vicious or less cutthroat in this game. Next we'll look at the crone tokens, and for each crone token a player has achieved they'll earn three points. So in this case both players have four crone tokens, which is 12 points. We'll then look at uh, corruption. So least corruption in their cauldron will get plus 10 points and most corruption in their cauldron will get plus 5 points. So now we'll have to basically dump the cauldron over and look at what comes out of the cauldron. So in this case the white player has five corruption tokens and the pink player has six corruption tokens. So in fact the white player has the least and they will get plus 10 and the pink player has the most they will get plus five. Next we'll be looking at most, uh, basically majorities in each of the cube colors within the cauldron. So we'll separate them out and going from top to bottom we do green, yellow, red, then orange. So uh, my pink player has four green, uh, the other player has also four green. So there they both tie and they each get five points. Next we'll do for yellow. We have four yellow here and three yellow here, so in fact the pink player gets an additional five points. Then red, four and seven, so in white here gets another five points. And finally orange, white has seven, pink only has two, so again white gets another five points. Once all of this scoring is resolved, now it's time to look at the uh, potion recipes that are scribed in each player's spellbook. So we'll move the cauldrons off to the side, give ourselves some breathing room. And we're gonna put all the crone tokens away because we're done scoring those. Again, just to give ourselves some table space here. And really we're only concerned with, I'm sorry, these are upside down. I'll turn them around so that the, for our viewing audience. Oh, and finally there. So now it's time to assign um, the colors to the cards, but the corruption tokens will also force you for each corruption token to discard one of the cubes of your choice. So you got to decide where you want to place your cubes to get, get you the most points, but then you might have to sacrifice some depending on the amount of corruption you have. In this case I'm matching cube to cube, color to color. I can't achieve this one, it has too many green. I could achieve this one. Maybe potentially. And then I don't have enough left. So my leftovers, I can start by matching one corruption token to each of the ones that I'm not going to spend to resolve my, um, my spell recipes or my potion recipes. And these will just go back to the supply. Now I have still have three corruption tokens, which means I'm gonna have to basically get rid of one of these cards. Now, 
Conveniently, I have one card that has three resources on it. It's only worth seven points. So that's the one I'm going to choose to get rid of. And these are going to go back to the supply. And then these corruption tokens are resolved. Leaving, with, leaving me with only these two cards that I can score. Each one is a value of nine. So my pink player will get 18 points. 74, 56 to 74. Next, we're going to look at the uh, recipes that are in the other players, under the other players' cauldron in their spellbook. And again, we're going to follow the same thing. So we're going to try and match up color to color. And then we're going to look and see what we can score and keep and what we'll have to discard based on the corruption tokens. Here we're not going to have enough. And then here we need four red and two orange. So we're going to discard these three back to the supply, leaving us with two left to discard. Now sadly there isn't enough cubes. Uh, we're missing a green cube here, so we're just going to get rid of these. They're not going to score anything. We're going to get rid of two more. based on the corruption tokens, and just discard the rest. So the ones that end up scoring is this card with 18. Uh, this card has a value of nine and another value of nine. So we're gonna score 36 points for white, bringing them to 112. And then white would win the game. So now we're ready to give our review of Cauldron, Bubble, and Boil. So what do you think, Stefan? I really like this game. Now, the review copy we got is a prototype, so uh, the components are not necessarily final, although the game is looking pretty far along already and was oh, yes. the art was fantastic. I mean, every, I, I really liked everything about this game. Yes, now this was a game um, that I wasn't too sure about, honestly. Like I was kind of like, yeah, let's give it a try because the theme really appealed to me. And then once we got to playing it, I was hooked. And honestly, this is one of those games I'm well we'll give our opinion at the end but like my general opinion on this was that it's kind of a sleeper hit for me it was one that I wasn't expecting to love absolutely love it so let's talk first about art and theme so again it's prototype like you said but mm -hmm. yeah the card art is fantastic uh, I'm not sure who the artist is they're probably in the credits of the manual but I'll have to look um, really great job on the art whoever the artist is <laughs> Kudos. Uh, looks fantastic. Yes, I, again, even though it's a prototype, it looks like all the hex cards had individual unique card art, um, especially all the expansions. All the expansions had finished art. The uh, the art on the back of the cards was a little dark, so like for us to film it, of course, it was a little bit tricky because the back of the cards are really dark and they're pretty simplified. But again, they're the back of the cards. I always kind of sometimes wonder why they like fancify the back of a board or the back of a card. In this case, you didn't, so it's good. It still looks good. It's just understated. And the <laughs> part that you're actually looking at is important. I also like how it's kind of laid out so the cards have multi-uses, right? They're good for hexes, they're good for gardens, and they're good for recipes. But it's very distinct. You can easily tell which areas for which it's not confusing at all. I found theme-wise, it was actually very appropriate <laughs> that you have, well, which is you know, historically are known, you know, there are hexes and curses. And of course you have to create your garden because they were big on, you know, creating their own recipes and, and brewing their own potions. So all that, and then of course the actual recipes themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, I really enjoyed the, uh, like you said, the fact that the hex cards have multiple uses. Mm -hmm. a, a game, a card game where the cards have multiple uses always appeals to me, and this didn't uh, didn't disappoint in that regards either. Nice. Um, I also really like the quality of the components. I mean, you know, the, the cubes are, are, are good and solid. Uh, the little mini cauldrons that come with the game are pretty fantastic. <laughs> I love um, You know, they're, 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 they seem to be just, you know, relatively inexpensive produced uh, plastic cauldrons, but they work really well for the theme of the game. My one minor gripe about those cauldrons is I wish the lip, uh, the opening of the cauldron was just a little bit wider so that it wasn't quite so difficult for people with fat fingers to reach in there and pull cubes or, yeah. or things out. Yeah, for sure. Even me with slightly longer, thinner fingers, I was sometimes finding it difficult to kind of get in there, yeah. but you kind of like hook and grab things. You're not just a look, so you just kind of 
feel around and grab what you need. But that's that's a very minor thing. Um, you know, it didn't really detract from the, the enjoyment or the gameplay at all. So uh, other than that, really great job. Mm -hmm. And I've played uh, uh, other games. There's another game I'll talk about in similar games that has that hidden component. That, and I really love that, that fact that you have to remember what's in there, kind of plan for it, you know, also plan for all the uh, corruption tokens going in. Mm -hmm. So that was really cool. So as we mentioned with components, it's a prototype. Things are going to change, but we did like what we've seen so far, for mm -hmm. sure. So mechanics. Do you do mechanics? Um, I like the fact that you're not allowed to look in your cauldron after you, after you start the game. So you know what's in there at the start, but then over the course of the game, the contents of your cauldron are going to change, which mm -hmm. thematically makes sense. Imagine you're a witch, you know, you've got a big cast iron pot, you're putting all these things in. It's hard to pick out what's what in the big cast iron pot once it starts all boiling together. So, I mean, it makes sense. You, yeah. you can't really tell what's in your cauldron. You have to remember what you put in there um, mm -hmm. and what comes out as well, because some of the cards will, will remove things yeah. from your cauldron. Either your, you yourself remove it or another opponent might remove them for you. So you have to always kind of keep those, um, the, the levels of each of those resources in, in mind as mm -hmm. you go throughout the game. Yeah. And for me, this is about the only time I won't have a black thumb. Because in this day, I can't kill cubes, so it's great. I love having a garden in this game. But I like the flow of the turn order. So the turn order is fixed. You do have to do the five steps in order. And I like that because um, you can't harvest a garden. You just plant it because Correct. you plant after you harvest. Yeah. So that's actually a very smart mechanic. Mm -hmm. It I think it balances a game where if someone had like a lot of uh, cards to get put down on a single garden. Because you can plant two gardens. So if you put like four cards down, and then it has tons and then all of a sudden you can harvest them. That makes it really easy for you to remember and really plan that. So I like that. And I love that you can't look at the recipes either. That's really cool. So you're like, what did I put in there? You kind of got to remember that as well. So it's a bit of a memory game, which for people like me, not so great. But I still thoroughly enjoyed, enjoyed that aspect. So that was great. So similar games. Um, I mean, there's a number of which themed games, but I can't think of anything a little bit maybe raise your goblet you read my mind that's exactly what i was thinking uh, of the hidden, hidden. yeah so you know the goblets have hidden things in them and you don't know if yours is poisoned or not or um so um that would be one that you know kind of has that hidden aspect mm -hmm. uh there's probably others like that that's the one that came to mind um, that was the one i was thinking of so yeah. <laughs> there's a number of other witch themed games or, or cauldron brewing boil you know bubble not cauldron bubble and boil, but there's a number of other games featuring, you know, uh, witches and, and brewing potions. So, uh, but nothing that uses quite these mechanics that I've seen. No, there are other games that have cards that have like multiple uses. They have mm -hmm. different things on them, like mm -hmm. Motaini in innovation. But the game mechanics of those are completely different. I find this one brings mechanics from a couple different games that I'm familiar with, pulls them together very smoothly, a nice, easy game. And the best thing about this is I found uh, it was very easy to learn the rules, even though it looked like there's a lot going on your your player aid i'm big on player aid so the fact that the player aid is right on your board it's yeah. great that is a huge bonus for me as soon yes. as i see a player aid but uh you, you have them right there so you can easily remember them there's the little little subtle things that you, you might have to refer to the rules but i don't think we had to refer to the rules very much mm -hmm. now another thing that the copy we got came with and i'm assuming because this is going to be actually a kickstarter so there's going to be like stretch goals for expansions and stuff like that yeah so there's three mini expansions with the game one seems to be included with the base game mm -hmm. and it's just optional whether you play with it or not and that is the uh Moons. sorry no not no, no sorry not the, the moon um, deck the, uh, Advan advanced. The, ad the Advanced Victory Conditions deck. It's called something else in the rules, but the cards actually say Advanced Victory Conditions. Uh, so uh, they just uh, you pull out two of those, and then they'll modify the end game scoring depending on you know the text and the cards. So that's, they, that's actually one very like the, the thing about the expansions is each expansion has like three variants. Yeah. So that's just one of the sure. variants of that particular expansion. Right. So there's two other ways that you could also use that expansion. So the other, uh, the next expansion, the second expansion is the Moon Deck. And the Moon Deck is just a series of eight cards. Um, you can play them a number of different ways, but the, the base way to play them is you reveal one at the start of every mm -hmm. round. Yeah. And it's in effect for the duration of that round, so all players get a chance to react based on that card. Mm -hmm. um, it's a bit of a crapshoot. Sometimes, you know, it's calling for a specific color. You may not have any of that color, so it doesn't really affect you. But if you if they happen to hit on on one that you know is good for you in that turn, it can really be a, a big boost to your mm -hmm. resources. Now this one in particular, I like that there are variants because 
Uh, they're numbered one through eight, mm -hmm. and in the variant we used, we just had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight um, in, order. In, in order. So they were the phases of the moon. You can shuffle them up as one of one of the variants, I believe, and it makes it a little bit more random so you don't yeah. know i know this is going to be coming up next turn so you can kind of plan for it so i like that and the other thing you can do also is uh, draw a new one at the start of every player's turn instead of every round so mm -hmm. then it becomes really chaotic they actually call that the lunacy variant because it comes a little a little bit crazy <laughs> um and so i haven't played with that variant yet but I'll, i might try that at some point in yeah. the future um the third expansion yep. is the um sorry the coven rolls deck yes. and so each player will get two random cards dealt to them roll cards and they'll be able to pick one to be their character throughout the course of the game and each character has different player powers so you get two to choose from and then you keep one discard the other and that's the variant we've played with so far, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the few times we played this game, yeah. the, there's a couple other variants, and yeah. one of them, I can't remember the number of cards, but you lay out, I think seven or right. something like that, cards on the on the board, and you can earn them through, you earn the by, roll throughout the by game. By meeting certain requirements on each card. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, I just love how many different ways you can change this game. You can just use the base game, and it's really fun. We've played it with all the expansions, and each yeah. one has added something new and different. Mm -hmm. So it's great. So overall opinion. <laughs> I really love this condition. game. Um, it's coming to Kickstarter real soon now. Um, it's going to be an instant back for me. Yeah, I I have I I can't even tell you how much I was so surprised at how much I really enjoyed this game. Everything from the art to the mechanics to the feel. It, I just loved it. So huge, huge two thumbs up. Like thumbs and toes and fingers Definitely. and everything. This is a great game, so I highly recommend you check out the Kickstarter and then hopefully it's gonna, if you miss the Kickstarter, hopefully it's gonna come to retail, uh, retail which you can get it in. So highly, highly recommend this game. And with that, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.